Hi everyone, and welcome to this lecture. Today what we're going to talk about is introduction to rotational forces and moments, also known as torque. And I've got a pretty cool animation here to show you it's all about rotations and things spinning, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, in this lecture, the concepts that we're going to cover are rotational forces, real-world applications of those forces, the application of the moment equation both in the real world and in ENS 102 type problems, and specifically how to do a sum of the moments and really what's the point of that equation. Next time what we're going to talk about is a little bit more nuance in the field of forces and uh, torques and realistically that's going to be force components and line of action together. And we'll discuss how both of those things right there are going to be very useful when you start to work with more sophisticated problems, specifically in ENES 102 and, in the future, the real world. So, let's talk about a brief introduction to rotational forces and begin to discuss what they are all about. Rotational forces, we love them, especially when you can spin in your chair. It's pretty fun times. That's what rotations is all about. We know, in a linear sense, if you take an object and you apply force this way, you will push that object and it's going to move along a straight line, especially if you apply that force to the center of mass of that object. There's no surprise there. If we take an object now and we apply our force not through the center of mass, but a little bit higher up, away from that center of mass, what you can predict is going to happen is that the object is going to rotate or spin. You've seen this all the time in your own life, probably. Maybe you're pushing a refrigerator <laughs> in the first problem. You know that you can either cause the refrigerator to slide, or you might actually cause it to tip over. We've seen that all the time. Take a quick little demo right here. Here's my water bottle. If I apply a force really high up, you can see that what begins to happen whew, is that it tips over. But if I were to put it flat on this table right here, you would see that it would slide normally. And that's actually a topic we'll talk about much later in the final unit of the class, friction and tipping. But for right now, all you need to know is that rotational forces cause things to rotate when you apply force away from the center of mass, or some distance away from a point of rotation. So, there are two types of moments that we really talk about in ENS 102. The first kind is more or less what we've been talking about thus far, and that refers to a force moment which is caused by essentially a force being applied some distance away from a point of rotation on an object. The other type is called a point moment. And essentially a point moment is considered a moment that happens right at that particular point. And a good example is kind of a doorknob. It's where the distance that your hands are away from the particular pivot point R are more or less zero. So we assume that that point moment occurs at exactly that point and doesn't actually have a moment arm in and of itself. Another thing you could think about is actually a screwdriver. A screwdriver is so small when you poke it onto the screw the moment arm involved more or less is very very small you can almost treat that as a point moment as well. We refer to moments as forces along the Z direction. Now why is that the case? The reason we'd say this is because usually your force might be along the x-axis, whereas your moment arm will be along the y-axis. So this is what's always going to be true in moments, that your moment arm and your force component, at least one of those things is going to have to be perpendicular to the other, and as a result, the thing will rotate about the z-axis, which goes vertically. That's what we refer to moments as forces about the z-axis. It's because that is the direction or the axes in which the rotation will usually occur about. Now let's talk about some real-world applications of moments. I want you to take a minute to just look around your room or to think about things you've experienced in the real world that relate to the concepts we've just talked about. Applying some force about a distance to cause something to rotate or spinning that thing in a point moment. Consider some objects, maybe look around your room or your house and try and come up with some applications of moments in the real world. I'll give you a minute or until this green question mark falls all the way down to the bottom to think about it. 
So some real world applications that you might have thought of are on a playground when you play with a seesaw. That's a perfect example of moments. You've got forces on either side of a pivot point, which is right in the middle of the seesaw, and that allows people to move up and down and have a grand old time. Particularly this girl with her best friend, the apple. It's a little sad, actually, but at least she has some friends. Another example is a wrench. As you can see, the wrench is longer, and the longer you make the wrench arm, the easier it will actually be to turn the bolt. So that's a really good example of you applying a linear force into a rotational force via a tool. Another good example is a lever. That's what allows people to lift things that are really, really heavy. It was another tool used by the Egyptians to build the Great Pyramids of Giza. Probably something that people are more familiar with that's a very common lever is the crowbar. What's the crowbar best used for? Well, if you had some fun in high school, you know it's very good to break into people's lockers and play jokes on them. But if you're like me, something I found out is that every locker combination in your high school stays the same forever. So actually, every time I went back to my high school, I used to open my locker, move some stuff around, or put in some candy, just to confuse whoever's locker it was at that time. At the end of the day, really, one of the biggest advantages of using moments, or understanding this concept, is that it allows you to provide mechanical advantage, or do extra work, magnify your output, that's what we're seeing here in the seesaw, the wrench, the crowbar, and the lever, is moments are a very powerful concept that allow you to do all sorts of really impressive things in the real world. So impressive that former great scientist and thinker Archimedes once said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Well, that sounds really impressive, Archimedes, but I don't think you really thought this through because there's no air in space. You would for sure be dead. But... Good thought. Okay, let's now talk about how to apply this equation to Aeneas 1 and 2 problems and in the real world more specifically. The equation that we use for moments is equal to force times distance. Now, this equation is going to be a little bit more nuanced than this, and we'll explain that later, but this is essentially what you should understand at this point. In order to cause something to rotate, you need to have a force and a distance away from the rotation point. The units that we'll be using for moments are force times distance, which are newtons times meters. This can also be pounds, inches, or pretty much any other unit that fits in that mold right there. But that's primarily what we'll use in this class. Sign conventions. Everyone needs to know this. Usually in the X and Y we say that up is positive, down is negative, to the right, one of these ways, I don't know which way is going to be to the right in the video, to the right, I guess is this way, would be positive, and to the left would be negative. But in moments, what do we say? Well, typically we say that counterclockwise is positive, whereas clockwise is considered negative. Why do we say this? The reason we say this is actually because of the unit circle. The unit circle increases in degrees and radians as you go counterclockwise. That's why, in this particular case, we will say that forces that cause something to rotate counterclockwise will be a positive direction of moment. Now, to be totally honest, this, like linear forces, doesn't matter. You can choose either way to make it positive or negative, just as long as you remain consistent throughout the problem and you don't go switching things up. So if you, at the beginning of a problem, say that counterclockwise is positive, well, then you have to stay with that convention throughout the problem, otherwise you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay, in statics, the moments equation is going to be very useful because it's going to give you another equation to solve systems of equations. What we'll say is that the sum of the forces, or the sum of the rotational forces, will be adding up to zero if that object is at rest. The sum of the moments is essentially the same thing. So our rotational forces are our moments. And really, the sum of moments on an object or system about any point will be equal to the moments that cause the object to go counterclockwise minus the moments that cause the, for the object to go clockwise. These two things will cancel out, and if the shape or the object or the system is at rest, then all of the rotational forces will add up to be zero. This is for a system in static equilibrium only, and that's the point of statics, right? Is all of the objects and systems that we're going to be analyzing are going to be at rest. So all of the forces need to balance out 
so that we don't have any accelerations. Now let's look at some fairly simple examples. If you've got these two blocks here, the mass on the left and the mass on the right, what do you need to do in order to make this system at balance? We can see that each block is one half the distance L from the pivot point. So if that's the case, the force times the distance, if the distances are both the same, we know that the forces of both blocks must be the same. As a result, the force in this case is their weight. Therefore, we know that the mass or the weight of both blocks has to be equal in order for the sea salt to balance. That's an example of the moments equation, right? Or the sum of the moments equation, where we're taking the counterclockwise moment caused by the box on the left, and we're subtracting out the clockwise moment caused by the box on the right. Now let's look at a slightly more complicated example, which is the following. What must you do if you want this system to be at rest? I'll give you a minute pause your video and think about this for just a second and figure out what the balance of the weights needs to be in order for the system to work out. Alright, in order to balance this system out, we know that the mass on the left must be three times greater than the mass on the right. Because the mass on the right is much farther away, the distance component of our equation has increased. Therefore, the force can go down, or the weight. That's why the lever arm, if you make a lever arm very, very, very long, a very small force applied along a long distance can create a very powerful moment. And this is exactly what Archimedes was talking about. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the following examples in order to show you how to do this. And I'm going to jump to my desk and solve all of these things by hand to show you how to apply the moments equation in a little bit greater detail. So in this particular question, what we have is a standard lever. The person is pulling on the lever arm and they're trying to lift a block on the other side. So this is very similar to what we just did a second ago with the seesaws, but now we'll showcase how this can use the sum of moments equation to actually solve for a numerical answer. Okay. What we're now going to analyze is this problem right here, where the person is pulling down on the lever arm and they're trying to lift this block up with the mass m. What we're given is the distance from the block to the pivot point, which is x1, and we're told that the mass of the block is m, and we know that the distance is x2 between the pivot point and the person's arm. What we see is that the person is applying a force f. So what do we know? We know that the moment equation is that moments, or rotational force, is equal to force times distance. And we know that for a system to be at rest, we know that the sum of the moments about a particular point must be equal to zero. So let's think about, in this question, what point are we rotating about? Well, the point that we're going to be rotating about is this point A. We'll call this our pivot point. So in order to do the sum of the moments equation, we just need to say that the sum of the moments is going to be equal to the sum of every force times distance about point A. Well, that's going to be the weight of this block right here, which is m times g, multiplied by the distance x1. So just to kind of highlight this, I'll take another pen out here and show you that mg is our force and x1 is our distance. Now, which way would this cause the system to rotate? Well, this block is pulling down and to the left, so this is going to be causing a positive counterclockwise moment. So, I always like to draw a counterclockwise symbol here and just put a positive. That way we can keep everything straight. Now we need to account for this force, because that's the other force in our equation. That's going to be this force times x2. So we have the force applied by our person multiplied by the distance x2. Well, it's not particularly hard to see here that our force applied is going to be our force, and that x2 is our distance in this equation. Well. This force is going down and to the right and would cause this whole system to rotate clockwise. So we actually will draw as a clockwise symbol 
and indicate that that is negative. So these things will subtract out. So what we get is pretty much to analyze this equation right here. We know both x1 and x2, that's given in our equation, or in our uh, statement in the beginning, and we also know the mass. We'll assume for this problem that g is about equal to 10 meters per second squared, just so our math is a little bit easier. And really the question is asking us to solve for f applied. That's what we need to solve for. So when we plug in everything we know, we get 8 times 10 times 1 minus force applied times x2, which is 3. And we know that this all equals 0. So this allows us to manipulate the equation such that we have fa times 3 is equal to 80 because we've multiplied those three terms out. Therefore, f applied is going to be equal to 80 divided by 3 newtons because that is the force unit. So there you have it. And what you can see from this is that the lever has mechanical advantage. We'll talk more about this later when we get into the frames and machines content, but a very simple thing that we can realize here is that in order to lift this block sh box straight up, we would normally have to apply its weight, which would be 8 times 10. But because we've got this lever, we actually have to apply one-third the force to lift the box up. So that's pretty cool. We've got a mechanical advantage of 3. There you go. That's our first moments example. All right, now that we just did that last question, what we're gonna do is do a slightly more advanced question here, which involves three shapes, not just two. And we're gonna use the sum of the moments equation to calculate the forces involved in order to keep the system at rest. Let me show you. Okay, let's now solve this problem here, which is more or less the same as the one we just did, but now it has three systems, or three forces rather than just two. So what we're told is that the mass of M1 is three kilograms, so we know this mass. We're told that the mass of three is one kilogram, but we're asked to solve for the mass of block two. This is our big question mark in this problem right here. So again, what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna sum the moments about a particular point, and we're gonna wanna say that that's equal to zero. And that's gonna be able to allow us to balance all of the equations and solve for the unknowns. So let's just say that the pivot point is point A, and that's going to be the fulcrum on which we're rotating about. So if we sum the moments about point A, what we'll see is it's going to be M1, the force, times G, times a distance of 5 meters away from that particular point. So again, just like we did in the previous problem, you can see that the moment is a force times a distance. And we can see that M1 would cause this whole beam to rotate counterclockwise. So M1 causes a positive moment to the left. And I'll draw that down here so we can keep that positive in our equation. The next thing that we want to do is we want to look at M3. M3, we can actually see, is going to cause things to rotate counterclockwise, or sorry, clockwise about point A. So that's going to be negative. So we say minus M3 G times a distance of one meter. And again, just like before, we have our force, which is the weight of our box, multiplied by the distance away it is from the pivot point. Then we're gonna have M2. We can see that M2 is also causing a negative clockwise moment because it would cause things to rotate clockwise. Therefore, we're gonna have to multiply M2G times its distance, which is one plus one away from the pivot point of A, or two. And again, you see we've got another force and another distance. And both of these rotate clockwise, which we call negative. Now we can plug in all of the knowns that we have. So M1, and again, we'll use the assumption that G is 10 meters per second squared. So we'll say that we have 3 times 10 times 5 minus m3, which is 1 
times 10 times 1 minus m2, which we don't know yet, times 10 times 2. And this is all set equal to 0. One thing you can see is going to happen is that the 10 is distributed among all of the terms. So we actually can get rid of that right away. This allows us to say that 15 minus 1 is e minus m2 times 2 is equal to 0. We can then simplify this equation to show that 14 is equal to m2 times 2. Solving for m2, we get that m2 is equal to 14 over 2, which is equal to 7 kilograms. Because again, we wanted to know the mass of block 2, not its weight. It's important to always make sure you're looking at what's being asked for so you don't deliver the wrong answer by mistake. And there you go. Pretty much straightforward problem where we're again just applying the fact that moments are force times distance and we're using the fact of the sum of the moments equation being equal to zero to find the equilibrium of a system at rest. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a fun problem that mimics the real world. How many of you have ever played basketball? Maybe in the pool or in the real world? Maybe some of you. Maybe some of you watched that special on ESPN recently about Michael Jordan. Let's say that Michael Jordan comes over your house because he's got nothing else to do and he starts putting on a show where he's jamming the basketball into the basketball hoop. Now, you as an engineer are trying to design the basketball hoop such that it's safe and it won't flip over when Michael Jordan jams down on that ramp as hard as he can. So, in order to solve this problem, you're gonna have to make a few assumptions, which is, well, how much force of a dunk is there that Michael Jordan's gonna apply? And what's the weight of Michael Jordan? So think about those two things before we get started. Pause your video for maybe just a second, kind of think about what information you need in this problem, and we'll go through and solve it. Now we're gonna look at our awesome friend, Michael Jordan, and try and figure out if we're engineers, how do we design a basketball hoop in order to not fall over when Michael Jordan slams it down with authority? So I asked you a minute ago, what sorts of things do we need to know in this problem? Well, because we're dealing with moments, and we know that moments, again, is equal to force times distance, we know that we're going to need to know forces and distances. So the things that we have to find out are one, the distances of all the important things involved in this hoop. So we know that the hoop, if it were to fall, where do you think it would fall about? Well, if Michael Jordan jammed the hoop too hard, it would probably rotate about this point over, which would be bad, all right? So if that's the case, this is our pivot point down here, and we'll call that point A. So we need to know the distances of all the things um, involved away from point A. And we only need to know the perpendicular distances, which I'll explain in a little more detail in the problem, or sorry, the lecture next time. So we know that the distance from point A to the end of the hoop is 20 inches. And we know that the distance from point A to the back of the hoop is 49 inches. Now we don't care about the height of the rim because the same force will cause it to rotate no matter what. And I'll, again, I'll explain that next time a little bit further. But we know that what we are gonna have to calculate is the force of the dunk, which is the assumption that we're making. And because Michael Jordan, when I looked him up in his heyday, he weighed about 200 pounds, I'm assuming that the force of his dunk is about 50% more than his weight, which kind of makes sense. We're gonna assume that the dunk's force is applied 300 pounds at the top of the rim, okay? Well, what's preventing this system from falling? It's the water that fills this tank. Because we know that the force of the dunk is gonna try and cause the basketball net to rotate clockwise. Whereas the force of the water that fills the bottom is gonna try and go counterclockwise. 
to prevent falling or tipping. So now that we kind of have everything we need to do, we can set up a moment equation and figure out how much water we need down here to prevent the system from tipping over. So if we sum the moments about point A, which is the bottom right of the basketball hoop, we know that we're going to have the water tank multiplied by its distance. Well, what's its distance away from point A? Is it 49? It's a common misconception to think that, whoops. But what we're going to have is we're going to have the weight of the water acts at 49 over 2, or one half the distance away. So we are going to have to say 49 over 2 away, because that's where its center of gravity or center of mass is. So we have the weight of the water multiplied by its distance, which as we've done in the previous questions, this is our force, this is our distance. This is causing a counterclockwise rotation, which is positive. And we subtract that 300 pounds, which is the force of the dunk, which we're assuming is being applied right here force of the dunk at 20 inches away. So now that we've got this fairly straightforward equation and we know that they balance out because we have one going counterclockwise and one going clockwise, we can solve and find that the weight of the water necessary if this was all to sum to zero and keep everything stationary, would be equal to 244 pounds. Well, that kind of makes sense, and that seems fairly reasonable. If you actually go online and you look this up, you can find that this tank here is a 35-gallon tank. And since water has a density of 8.3 pounds per gallon, you can see that a typical tank would hold 291 pounds of water. This is good news because it means the engineers that actually built this basketball hoop did their job because 291 is greater than 244 pounds and this should mean that the hoop will not tip even if Michael Jordan comes to your house and dunks on it really, really hard. Other things I'm not necessarily accounting for are the weight of the metal and kind of the weight of the plastic over here. And I guess I'm also not really accounting for the weight of this, but one could imagine that it would actually need even more force over here um, as a result of the added weight. So you probably would be pretty good and would not actually fall over. And you can see that's a fairly good margin, so something we'll talk about even later in the course is this idea of safety factor. And what we can see is that we are relatively safe because if we need 244 pounds to prevent this thing from tipping, we've got 291. That's 50 pounds more. That's like a decent chunk more than what we would need. If this tank held exactly 244 pounds of water, well, if Michael Jordan applied even one more pound of force, this hoop would just go towering down, and that would not be very good. Well, there you have it. As an engineer, that's exactly the process that you would follow in the real world. You would look at the conditions that you're trying to solve for, you'd make some assumptions, and then you'd design a system down here with real-world conditions to prevent the thing you want to not happen from happening.